Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast Health Literacy 2.0 Workforce Wellbeing. I'm Seth Serksner, Chief Health Officer at EdLogix. Very, very pleased today to welcome a friend and colleague, Dr. Stephen Neldner from Mercer, who I've worked with for many years, has been an industry leader, and I would like to think that I call him a friend as well. So, Stephen, as I'm alluding and rambling on, we've known each other now, you know, 15, 20 years, I think. I know your background very well, but for the audience, can you just kind of share a little bit about your background and your career path and where you are today? Yes. And first of all, I do consider you as a friend, Seth, and thanks very much. It's been a great journey that we've had together in the professional lives and personal lives as well. So my background consists of quite a circuitous path to get where I am today and have been with Mercer now in my 19th year. So I've been with Mercer for a long time as a consultant. But I started out in a hospital situation after I completed my education, started a hospital-based health and well-being initiative that also included a metabolic institute, cardiac and pulmonary rehab programs, outpatient physical therapy. So combined center, we even had an orthopedic research center attached with the, the operation. So still was very close to clinical work there. Eventually, after a few years, moved away from the hospital and started my own small consulting company, still working with hospital organizations around well-being and rehab services, and then ran into an opportunity where I eventually became the president of a provider organization that provided services to employers around health and well-being. I decided after a few years to go back into the corporate world and took over responsibility for a health and well-being initiative for a Fortune 100 company in America. And we did on-site clinics. We did traditional well-being, on-site fitness centers. And quite broad, with a definition of well-being that close to what we're defining it as today, multidimensional. And after that, moved back to California. My wife looked at me one day and said, I'm going back to California. Are you coming? <laughs> And I didn't pause for more than a second and said, yeah, let's go. So, so you were Florida-based at that time? I was Florida-based at that time. Yeah. And had spent 14, 15 years in Florida, but had met my wife and was married in California. So we had always intended to come back to California. And one day she was going to her domain of clients in South Florida, and I was going to have to fly to Northern Virginia. And in an airport, she said that to me. And I said, yeah, let's go. Let's pack it up and let's go. We did that. So moved it back to California, started another small consulting company. And at one point in time, I recognized that I'm either going to have to scale to compete with the Mercers and other major consulting firms of the world or join them. And I had a good experience with a Mercer consultant in that previous corporate life and contacted someone at Mercer. And someone connected me with a guy named Dr. Seth Serksner, who interviewed me and hired me. <laughs> so, I remember our <laughs> breakfast meeting very well, Stephen. It was a good experience for both of us. Yeah, great. 19 years, hard to believe. And I know that path has evolved a bit, but now how do you title yourself and what are you focused on? What are the big things you're working on these days? Yes, our role has evolved over the course of that 19 years from being a generalist and working on almost everything that was related to health and well-being from prevention to condition management measurement and evaluation, vendor selection. Now that the world has become so much more complicated with multiple vendors, we often call them point solutions or targeted solutions. It's difficult to be an expert in every one of those vendors and solutions. So we've aligned ourselves in a vertical arrangement in our practice, which is called the Mercer Well practice, focused on health and well-being. And we have more narrowed views of the different vendor landscapes within different verticals. I happen to lead the well-being vertical. So I'm responsible with a team of other consultants to be aware of the vendors in that space, to develop intellectual capital for our colleagues to use with their clients to work on strategy development, knowledge of the vendor landscape, and awareness of compliance issues and other things that are relevant to a worksite health and well-being initiative. It's so fascinating. A lot of different ways to go with this. But to start, 
let's talk about the vendor landscape a little bit. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to name names or you can if you're excited about some, but like what's hot these days? What's going on out there that is attracting your attention and clients' interest? One of the things that has been an interesting and challenging topic for many organizations historically is do we provide incentives for participation or not? And that's still an issue. Okay. Yeah. It's still an issue, an emerging issue, I think, in the sense that some organizations that we work with are saying, are we really just giving away money for people to check the box and do something to just earn the points or the dollar amount or do the different activities that are required to get a premium differential, for example? That's still a popular one. And as you know, when we were doing this work together a decade or more ago, there was some use of premium differential and other health plan-based incentives that was a starting point. And we encourage organizations to maybe consider that initially. And whether it was a health plan-based incentive or whether it was a cash equivalent incentive, in the early years, you might have something there to encourage people to try it. But we had hoped and we had encouraged organizations to think of it in the context of eventually, over the course of hopefully not too much time, employees are going to find some value for themselves, something meaningful for themselves in the well-being experience that would allow you to gradually diminish the amount of reliance upon those external rewards. But some of the organizations are now saying, we're giving people $800 of your premium reduction if you participate in well-being. And what does participation mean? Does it mean self-reported things that I can do in the course of a half an hour of checking the box? Or is it sustained participation in things that are meaningful to me in the broad definition of well-being? And I think we see some of the vendors recognizing that in the platforms that they're building, going back to your question about what is the vendor landscape looking like, more multidimensional view of well-being than it was more physically focused years ago. Now, the other dimensions of mental, emotional, social, financial, spiritual purpose are all being considered to different degrees, delivered upon by different vendors in different ways. And I think here's where that emergence of these point solutions that I alluded to earlier is completing the picture in some cases, in some cases confounding the picture because now there's a lot more overlap. I think that's what we're really working a lot with our clients to understand what is the right collection of vendors in your so-called ecosystem and how do you provide incentives for those? Do you provide incentives for those? Do we move away from external incentives and build on intrinsic motivation? I think those are the challenges of today and tomorrow. And then of course, the virtual workplace. Well, you know, it's so interesting because as you say, we were doing this work, we've been doing incentive work since the, I guess they call it the knots, right? Since the early 2000s, really came on board and as part of a benefit design, an integrated benefit design, use premium differentials or some other things. We started to see, you know, some improvement in certain things, one-time events, but then there was question marks about that. So it's interesting that we're still in that space and the science or the evidence around that, it's just so variable. And I guess we used to think that that's also because there's so many other factors that affect engagement, culture and leadership support and good communications and design and all those factors. I wonder though, just to stay with this topic for a minute, I've often thought mental health in particular, things like an EAP or just mental health services and however far you want to stretch that into well-being, it seems like you shouldn't have to incentivize somebody for that. Are there certain buckets where you're just saying, no, we don't incentivize for preventive screenings or certain specifics, but many things that we used to incentivize, we don't anymore? Is that some of the evolution? Yeah, I would agree. We're definitely seeing that, having those conversations. Coaching is probably an example. You can speak to both sides of that, right? Lifestyle coaching. that. If someone is truly interested in helping themselves and they're ready to make a change, shouldn't providing free coaching to that individual be enough of an incentive to participate in it? You know, people go out and hire their own life coaches directly. So if you have the opportunity to work with someone that your employer is paying for, that might be enough of an incentive right there. So that's one area, of course. And as you mentioned, many of these point solutions, musculoskeletal is an example. If you have pain, do I need to incentivize you to use the musculoskeletal 
service that we offer. But then it gets blurry again. If you go a little bit further out there, let's stick with musculoskeletal. Now, if you're talking about encouraging employees and members to use expert medical opinion as a way to screen for whether or not you really do need that surgery before you go to that surgery. So right. maybe there should be an incentive for using that or disincentive if you don't use that. So it gets complicated once you get into the nuances of it. But I, generally speaking, the way you framed it, I think there are certain activities that probably don't require a financial or extrinsic motivator. It should be from within and something meaningful and valuable to the individual to motivate them. So let's talk about this other issue you raised, which is kind of a, I'll just call it a crowded point solution space. Again, you and I, we've talked about point solution fatigue, meaning, you know, either the clients and or their employees are already overloaded or why can't I just have something simple that's across the board? There are gaps in the system all over the place. And there are creative, innovative vendors out there that are quick to fill the gap. That's kind of the beauty of it. It's become such a complicated ecosystem. How are you advising your clients to address the barrage that I'm sure they're getting all the time. Your practice can't keep up with all the vendors that want to be vetted and included. The employees don't know all the resources available to them. What's the latest? Have you solved that yet? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's on the schedule for this afternoon. After oh, good. All right. Well, you let us know. <laughs> no, I need a few more minutes for that. No, seriously, that is the million dollar question, quite frankly. And I think one of the things that you mentioned really is that at the heart of that discussion and value proposition is, even if we put this all together in the most seamless way, how do we make sure that our employees and members know that it's there and that it's right for them? And how do they easily get involved with it? So as we've discussed many times, communication, promotion, seamless navigation, sometimes advocacy, which is closely aligned to navigation, those things are really crucial to help organizations get some value from their investment. It's not just this whole lineup of X number of different point solutions and a hub vendor at the middle of that. But to give you some examples of things that we're seeing of how organizations and vendors are tightening up, there are a number of these sometimes called hub or core well-being vendor platforms that serve as the front door, if you will, to the well-being initiative. And they will be able to integrate other vendor partners. Now a number of these hub well-being vendors are curating their own partnerships with different specialty point solutions and offering it through their entry point, their front portal, and they are making some of those activities on those third-party vendor platforms rewardable on their core platform. So they'll get data feeds from the different vendors for activities. For example, if we're talking about a mindfulness vendor, if someone goes through different sessions of mindfulness, they can get credit for that on the core platform in the points ecosystem or the cash incentive ecosystem, whatever the vendor has set up or that a particular employer. So I think that's one way that vendors would like to help their clients, those core vendors, those hub vendors like to help make it a simpler decision for their employer clients to go through them, one source, one contract, they do the subcontracting. And we have some clients that prefer that. And then we have other clients that say, well, I still want the best in the class, the best possible service in each of those different areas. And I'm willing to put in the extra effort to do that. Now, you probably have to have organizational bandwidth and resources to be able to manage multiple direct right. relationships right. and right. reporting and all those kinds of things. So that's probably a more sophisticated or a deeper budget kind of organization that does have the resources to do that kind of management. So somewhere in between is probably where the sweet spot is, depending on what kind of organization you are. And that's why a variety of those options are out there today. So interesting. So it makes perfect sense to me. You know, some front door, some best in class, somewhere in between. I'm hot on this idea of health literacy. And this has evolved, too, from the old days of brochure wear and an orthopedic drawing a picture of where they're going to cut your knee. And she says, you know, and you bring home the drawing and what I call very kind of a flat health literacy 1.0 to now what we've evolved to this health literacy 2.0, which takes behavioral science and gamification. So I would say that we 
could be much more advanced in our incentive approach and use games. And, you know, the gaming industry knows how to do that. I mean, the online gaming with different levels and recognitions and rewards. And I just haven't seen that as often used in health education and health learning. So taking behavioral science and gamification along with data and personalizing and really understanding kind of what the data is saying, what are people searching for, things like that. And then multimedia interactive content. So I couldn't close a baby stroller. And I went on YouTube to figure out how to close the darn thing. Everybody uses YouTube. So, and I believe it's the number two searched on topic within YouTube are health topics. So having this combination of behavioral science and gamification with data and interactive media to bridge us to what I'm calling health literacy 2.0. Ed Logix, who sponsors this and is one of the companies that kind of does that. I think they do it really well and they have points, like you say, they play out a front door model and are able then to have people learn about their other vendors and all the rest. And I say this somewhat commercially, but more of it operationally to show your point that a front door can be a creative front door. My question to you, because I've been talking to so many clients and have all these podcasts I'm doing about this health literacy People always say, hey, it's a great idea, Seth. Yes, health literacy, big gap. We know the research. But when it comes to implementing for an employer, there's still some kind of bridge. What are your thoughts on health literacy and where it fits in that? Is it the well-being ecosystem, the overall health benefit system? What are your thoughts? I think I'll start by framing health literacy or including health literacy under the umbrella of health equity. I have a number of clients, as we know, many, many organizations are focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion these days. I actually have one organization in particular and others that are close to it in this passion for health equity. And this one organization in particular, it's a governmental organization, a very large organization. Their whole health strategy is health equity. So given that they're so focused on creating equity and delivering health equity across all of their health and well-being initiatives and in the employee experience in the workplace, outside of the workplace, because it's broadly reaching geographic entity as well, that it is very interested in finding ways to help people connect with, number one, the benefits that are already there for them, but even more so recognizing that previously marginalized populations which are now their prioritized populations, may not have the tools to be able to understand what's available to them and how to use it. So I think the idea of health literacy is very relevant to a focus on health equity. And I would even say more than a focus on, I like the phraseology of health equity by design because it's very intentional. So we're really being intentional about what we do. And when we do that, then we're looking for all the ways that we can help people connect with the things that they need in the ways that that's appropriate for them. And I think health literacy certainly fits squarely in the middle of that. It's so interesting you say that. I really appreciate it because I've written about this topic and I talk about health equity as the umbrella and the factors under health equity are health disparities, because oftentimes people note that, you know, people get differential services based on conscious and unconscious biases of providers health literacy, their ability to understand and have the skills and confidence to navigate the system, social determinants of health, which we're all very familiar with, and then one more bucket, which is this personal determinants of health, which has to do with personal resilience around connections and positive outlook. So it's a good insight, I think, and a good reminder that, and depending on who's listening to this, whether you're kind of in that well-being vertical or not, we know now because well-being is encompassing ESG and diversity and all these other things that maybe there's a partnership there. I too have seen some companies talk about their well-being strategy is basically a health equity strategy. So yeah, really helpful. Well, Stephen, thank you. There's probably a lot you could kind of give us as kind of parting words, but there's employers out there trying to figure this out. 
They're dealing with that complicated ecosystem you talked about. They're dealing with incentives. They're dealing with all kinds of new issues, diverse workplace, like you just said, dispersed workplace, and mental health, huge trends, so many things on the plate for them, along with running a business. <laughs> we always kind of throw that in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we're trying to run a business. <laughs> we have a lot of pressure to hit our targets. What are a couple of the big themes you want to leave us with? Yeah, I would say that don't do it just because you've always been doing it that way. I know it's a trite old phrase, but I see so many examples of organizations who just continue to do the same thing year after year, get the same kind of results, not optimal results, but the same kind of results, and wonder why they're not making any progress. And I would say that step back, start with a blank slate, ask yourself, if we had to do this all over again, how do we go about doing this? And be willing to take that risk. And that's a challenge for a lot of organizations, especially those who sponsor or are managing their well-being initiatives, because sometimes their key success metric has been level of participation or how many incentives you've given them, right? And if you remove those financial incentives that people have become very dependent upon now, what is that going to do to your participation rate in the next year or two? By the way, I've had examples of organizations who've moved away from premium differentials and strong external incentives and actually saw over the next few years in a higher level of engagement. And it was a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. It was understanding social determinants of health. They had a lower page workforce that they did some accommodations to, more available to them. So it is possible. I've seen examples of it where organizations can rethink everything and make a pivot to something that is more appropriate for today's world. And I think that just lays into the context of what is the next generation looking for? What is our current workforce and evolving workforce looking for? Listen to the people, ask what they have in mind, what's meaningful to them, and focus on those things. And when you start with that as your value proposition, serving people what they need, where they need it, when they need it, I think you probably have a higher likelihood of overall success. Yeah, I love that idea. I love the clean slate, both from a program perspective and a metric perspective. And it does take some courage, right? Because your numbers theoretically could change, but who knows? Maybe they actually will go the other way, as you mentioned, and really getting grounded in what matters to the people you're serving. So, Stephen, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. This has been a great excuse for us just to connect, but I really appreciate your comments and your thoughts and have a great rest of your day. Thank you everyone for joining us.